It's often not the destination which matters most, but what we discover of God and of ourselves on the journey. That's what stays with us and shapes us into fuller people. Ordinary time. Ordinary, yes, but perhaps not quite so ordinary as we softly tread in the footsteps of Jesus. And in the unexpected twists of a well-spun parable and the turns of lives redirected anew towards God, we embrace the adventure, growing taller yet. Hello and welcome to Windows on Worship. My name is Carl and it's really good to have you with us, especially if you're tuning in for the first time. You're very welcome. This week we're going to be looking at the parable of the talents, a story Jesus told that defies easy or lazy interpretation. And we'll be thinking about how it challenges the standpoint from which we approach the scriptures. Before we get started on that, however, if you've not done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet that accompanies this act of worship. You can find the link for that in the video description in YouTube, but you may need to click on show more in order to reveal it. The front side of the worship sheet has some space for you to make your own notes as we go along some questions for you to ponder along the way and various places where you're invited to share your thoughts and prayers with others in the comments section, particularly if you're watching the premiere and can use the live chat function in YouTube. The reverse side of the worship sheet contains the jukebox playlist, a set of YouTube videos chosen especially to help you go further in your praying and pondering through the week. And so, as we gather together before God in our different places, using the gift of technology, we bring our opening prayer for ordinary time. The words of this prayer, and indeed the words of all the prayers and responses we'll share in together today, will appear on the screen. Please join in with those words in yellow and bold type, either in your head or out loud, as you're most comfortable. Let us pray. God of adventure and growth, open our hearts, ready our minds and fire our imaginations so that as we gather together before you, use technology to connect with each other and ponder the life-giving stories of Jesus, we might discover more of your goodness and be swept up by the Holy Spirit as she nurtures, disturbs and inspires us on our journey into fullness of life. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, we offer a starter for 10 question that's there to get you thinking about the subject matter for the week. If you'd like to share your response to this with others, do please type it into either the live chat or the main comments during this time. But if you just want to think about it by yourself, that's equally fine. So this week's starter for 10 is, think about a time when you were able to use your talents to serve others. What happened and how did this make you feel? <laughs>
As we come to our prayers of thanks and praise, we're going to use a chant from the Teze community, In the Lord I'll Be Ever Thankful. As we hear that sung a number of times, I invite you to use this as a space for reflection in which to bring your own praises and thanksgivings to God. Let us pray. <laughs> And so, with our praises in our hearts, we now come to the psalm that's set for this week, which is Psalm 90. And you can find the version of it that we're using today in the Methodist hymn book, Singing the Faith, at number 816. Let us pray. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the earth and the world were formed, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, O children of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are but like yesterday, which passes like a watch in the night. You sweep them away like a dream. They fade suddenly like the grass. In the morning it's green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up withered. But we consume away in your displeasure. We are afraid at your wrathful indignation. You have set our misdeeds before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. When you are angry, all of our days are gone. Our years come to an end, 
like a sigh. The days of our life are three score years and ten, or if our strength endures, even four score. Yet the sum of them is but labour and sorrow, for they soon pass away, and we are gone. Who regards the power of your wrath, and your indignation, like those who fear you? So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Turn again, O Lord, how long will you delay? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us with loving kindness in the morning, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Give us gladness for the days you have afflicted us, and for the years in which we have seen adversity. Show your servants your works, and let your glory be over their children. May the gracious favour of the Lord be upon us. Prosper our handiwork, O prosper the work of our hands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We come now then to our prayers of renewal. Let us pray. Liberating God, who brings good news to the poor, freedom to the captives and hope to the hurting. We bring to you those things in need of renewal in our own lives and in the life of the world we share. We bring to you those things for which we are sorry. God of mercy, forgive us. We bring to you the burdens we carry and sorrows we bear. God of love, comfort us. We bring to you the brokenness and oppression in our world. God of justice, disturb us. We bring to you the times we've hidden from the risks of love. God of courage, fortify us. And we bring to you the failures of your church to stand for justice. God of liberation, convict us. Liberating God, who brings good news to the poor, freedom to the captives and hope to the hurting. Thank you that you set us free to follow you and to be ambassadors for your kingdom of love. Amen. Our reading for this week comes from Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 25, verses 14 through to 30. As you hear it read, keep your ear open for any particular words or phrases or ideas that jump out to you. 
you might want to make a note of them in the space that's provided for that on the worship sheet, because these could point to the things the Holy Spirit especially wants to say to you today through this text. Jesus told another parable about the kingdom of God. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who received the five talents went off at once and traded with them, and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents and saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I'll now put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what's yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away from them. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. There are times when we read the parables of Jesus and it might seem fairly obvious what he was getting at. Indeed, at various points throughout the Gospels were provided with an inside track, an explanation of what Jesus was getting at when he told these challenging stories of his, either to his disciples in private or to the crowds. The parable of the talents, however, is one that defies easy or lazy interpretation. It's a very unsettling story and it can be interpreted on a wide variety of levels in different ways. Some interpretations sit rather more comfortably with me than others. So, for example, I really struggle with those who argue that Jesus was advocating a kind of prosperity gospel where material wealth and divine blessing are portrayed as linked together. I also struggle with texts um, that argue what this parable is doing is giving God-given blessing, as it were, to ruthless business practices, vulture capitalism, as it's sometimes been called. But it's not difficult to find commentaries and sermons arguing for those very viewpoints. 
and indeed to stumble across other readings that, while more benign, also fail to grapple with what Jesus has been saying here. It begs the question, as we look at this challenging parable, of what a good reading of the Bible might look like. When I was training for ordained ministry, I was taught that a good reading of the Bible had to bring three different elements together and hold them in balance. The first is the historical context of a given passage, which in this case likely reflects something of Jesus' understanding of economic injustice. I also had to think about the intention of the author, so in this case the author of Matthew's Gospel and the context in which Matthew's community found themselves. And finally we need to think about our own perspectives as readers to acknowledge that we come to the Bible not as neutrals but as people who look at it through particular lenses reflecting the culture around us and our own life experience. So we've got historical context, the intention of the author and our own perspectives as gospel readers. Now the emphases that we place on the three different components of a good reading will vary, will vary depending on the material we're looking at and our own particular dispositions, what you might call our own theological stances. But it's nonetheless true that if any of our interpretations become too skewed in one direction or another, they risk ending up being rather unbalanced and actually pulling the text out of shape rather than allowing it to come to life and speak into our context. And it's also true that we need to consider the practical implications of the views we put forward. Readings of the Bible that violate the fundamental principle that all people matter infinitely to God fall short of the standards of good reading to which we must endeavour to hold ourselves. And that includes, I would argue, those readings of the parable of the talents that aim to justify a kind of prosperity gospel or the exploitation of others in the name of profiteering. So what are we to do with this parable? Well, one of the first things to note about it, uh, which highlights how it differs from in emphasis from the similar parable that we find in Luke chapter 19, is that the Greek word talaton, from which we derive our English word talent, means something quite different to what we might assume. When we think of somebody's talents, we might think of their individual gifts and skills and abilities, the things they have to offer in the service of God and neighbour. But the Greek word, despite how many school assemblies focused on it in this way, does not actually contain any of those connotations. Instead, the Greek word talaton refers to a sum of money, indeed a vast sum of money, equal to what a labourer might have been able to earn after 15 years. But that was, this monetary meaning, the one and only meaning that the Greek word talaton has. So when, as I say, school assembly sermons in particular, took the parable of the talents to mean that this is about not wasting our God-given gifts and skills, well, of course that's important and it's a perfectly laudable message. It's not, I think, what Jesus is getting at here. It does not form a good reading of the text. It's skewing things too much to our perspective as modern readers because of the way the word talent has come to be used in English. If we're going to have a good reading of the text, we need to resist this distortion of it, which perhaps also flows from a desire to have a nice, simple, concise message or a family friendly reading, as it were, over the gospel. We need also to be willing to deal with questions of economic ethics and not dodge them in favour of something easier and more comfortable. 
The most stark parts of this parable come in the final two verses, particularly in verse 29 that talks about those who already have some being given more and those who have nothing, having what little they have being taken away from them. The stark statement frames everything that comes uh, before it and indeed perhaps after it in this parable. Now, some commentators argue that this verse was a later addition, either added in by Matthew or by a subsequent editor of Matthew's Gospel. I reckon if it is original to Matthew, it reveals a great deal about how Matthew really struggled to get his head round the ethics and worldview of the Kingdom of Heaven. Matthew was very heavily influenced, I would argue, by the context around him, drawing parallels with how things worked in the Roman Empire and assuming that the culture of the Kingdom of God would mirror what Matthew found around him, what his community experienced, rather than allowing God's Kingdom and Kingdom values to critique the way the world around them worked. I think it's a mistake, in fairness to Matthew, that we very often still make today, again, skewing our readings of things. If we want to understand where the author of Matthew's Gospel was coming from, we need to be willing to recognise that the Gospel writers were as fallible and as capable of getting it wrong as we ourselves are. It could be that Jesus' warning here was intended for the religious elites of the Israel of his day that he called out in Matthew 23. Or it might be that Matthew's faith community contained people who were not taking the work of God seriously. But either way, if we assume that the figure of the master represents God, then the third servant is a failure. They are somebody who is not shining out the light of God into the world. They are not using the resources given to them for good. They are burying them, they are hiding them. The story read like that, treating the master as representing God, a reading from the centre you might say, makes the parable into one about failed discipleship which again is a very laudable message. But again, I don't think it's what Jesus was getting at here. I fear that that reading that makes an assumption that we often don't even really kind of think about of equating God with the master, with the figure with the worldly power, actually is, is one that even gives us quite a dangerous portrayal of God as a result of this parable. That's firstly because, and hopefully it's obvious, that that kind of reading equating God with an oppressive master really does not sit with the portrayal that we find of Jesus in the rest of the New Testament as someone who literally embodied God's love. That depiction of God as an absentee landlord who condemns the third servant to the outer darkness with the weeping and gnashing of teeth and who does not actually seriously dispute the third servant's assessment of him as harsh and dishonest really does not sit with Jesus Christ. Secondly, we do need to keep in mind as we read this that while burying valuables, treasure, might seem odd to us in a culture where actually you'd go and put it in the bank if you weren't someone who hid it under the mattress. In those days there weren't those kind of institutions and so it was perfectly natural for someone to bury treasure that they wanted to keep safe. And moreover, trying to get interest out of money that had been lent to fellow Jews violated the law of Moses as we see in Exodus 22 and Deuteronomy 23 and Leviticus 25, so at least three times. It was okay to charge interest to Gentiles, but not to fellow Jews. 
And so when the servant is lambasted for not at least getting interest on the one talent that they were given, we do need to keep in mind, again, another cultural difference between then and now. Thirdly and finally, as Barbara Reed reminds us in our a very helpful commentary on this passage, Jesus did not inhabit the kind of capitalist system that we do today where amassing more and more wealth for oneself is often seen as a good thing. Instead, Jesus was living, Reed argues, under a system of what we might call limited good. And what limited good means effectively is that if one person accumulates more and more and more, that means another must end up with less and less and less. So if somebody accumulates more and more and more and more to themselves, that was not seen as a good thing, Reed argues, but rather as portraying them as greedy, as wicked, to use her word. If we take to our hearts those three pieces of information, recognising how the picture of God uh, that might be put forward if we see God as the master in this parable does not fit with Jesus, recognising the difficulties around the idea of charging interest, and finally, understanding that we're talking about a, a non-capitalist society, a society shaped by limited good. It gives us, I think, a potentially very different reading of the parable of the talents. A reading that comes more from the margins rather than from the centre. I think the first hearers of this story might have made an identification of Jesus and of God, not with the figure of the master, but with the figure of the third servant. The one who, unlike the first two who double their master's money, does not collaborate with their master in the exploitation of the poor and vulnerable, does not violate the law of Moses by charging interest to fellow Jews, and does not buy into the idea that greed is good in violation of the concept of limited good. After all, we know that Jesus himself would be cast out into the outer darkness of Golgotha, beyond the walls of the city of Jerusalem, when he was crucified, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, if ever there was one. I think the identification is made between those two figures, the third servant who doesn't go along with economic exploitation, and of Jesus, who after all was crucified not for telling people to be nice, but because he loved with a radicalness and a freedom that made him too hot for the authorities, religious and secular alike, to handle. He challenged the ruling elites who hoarded wealth and status and power to themselves. And indeed, Jesus has done a lot of calling out of these things in the chapters immediately before Matthew 25. Pulling all of this together, then, shows us that really what we make of the parable of the talents comes down to who we interpret the figure of the master as representing. Is it God or not? Is it the people who conspired against Jesus, for example? Is it something else? We certainly know that the religious authorities of the day wielded huge political and economic power, as well as religious. And it seems that they were as much against Jesus subverting of the order of things, the socio-economic socio order, uh, as much as Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who would have been in town at that point, did. In the context of the unfolding narrative that we find in Matthew's account of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, parables such as the parable of the talents really pack a punch. A good reading of this passage brings together, I think, the different elements the historical context of Jesus's care for the marginalised and his turning of the socio-economic order of the day upside down 
and inside out. The context of Matthew's faith community who were struggling to be faithful disciples amid a society that was stacked in favour of the religious and political elites and their exploitation of the poor. And indeed, our own reading, a reading that really challenges many of the everyday assumptions that we often make without thinking about it as we come to this text. A good reading will not shy away from any of this or indeed from its implications for today. Are we willing to challenge the way in which injustice and exploitation affects so much in our world across a wide range of issues from the dreadful situation we've seen in Israel and Palestine in recent weeks through to issues like modern slavery and the gig economy in our own country? Are we people who are willing to stand against these things, even when it costs as much as it did the third servant in the story? Dare we ask ourselves some really hard questions about the way we live and use our voices to proclaim the kingdom of God by doing justice, loving mercy and walking humbly but publicly with God as revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. I pray, friends, that as we grapple with this parable over this week, that we may have the courage to truly be kingdom people, like I would argue the third servant was in this story of Jesus. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, in order to help you go deeper in your praying and pondering, we recommend a resource that you might find helpful. This week's resource is a book that I've recommended before, but I think is really useful, particularly in the context of grappling with a tricky story like the Parable of the Talents. It's from 2012. It's by biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan, and it's called The Power of Parable. It explores the stories that Jesus told, but also how they then shaped the stories that were told about Jesus by the Gospel writers. And it links very much, I would suggest, to how we make sense of the parable of the talents, the parable of the wedding banquet, perhaps back in, back in Matthew 22 that we looked at a few weeks ago, and various other really challenging stories. It's a very well laid out book, it's very clear and accessible and very challenging. So that's John Dominic Crossan's The Power of Parable. We now come then, friends, to our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. If you have a prayer request, do please type it during this time into either the live chat or the main comments. But if you're going to reference a particular individual, because this is a very public forum, please only use their initials. If you have four candles or tea lights to hand, you may wish to light them along with the imagery on the screen as we pray about the different aspects of the liberation that God came to bring in Christ and for different people who are struggling today in our world. Let us pray. Liberating God, you came to bring good news to the poor. We pray for all of those who are struggling to make ends meet for those whose livelihoods have been decimated by COVID-19, and for those parts of the world where grinding poverty is the everyday norm for far too many people. God of light, shine in the darkness. Liberating God, you came to bring release to the captives. We 
We pray for those in prisons across the world, for those who work in criminal justice and for victims of crime, for those imprisoned by sadness, grief or despair, and those feeling trapped by mental health struggles. God of light, shine in the darkness. Liberating God, who came to bring recovery of sight to the blind. We pray for those blinded to their worth by abuse and hate. For those routinely overlooked in deeply unequal societies. And the people pushed to the margins by popularist policies. We pray also for those struggling to see a positive future for themselves. God of light shine in the darkness. Liberating God, you came to let the oppressed go free. We pray for those whose lives are overshadowed by conflict, those living under oppressive regimes across the world, people oppressed by the stifling moral effect of affluence, those facing discrimination simply because of who they are. God of light, shine in the darkness. In a time of quiet, we bring to you, liberating and loving God, our prayers for those people and our hearts today. And so, in whatever form or language is most familiar to you, please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So thank you for joining us for Windows on Worship. I do hope you found this time useful and thought-provoking. If you want to keep in touch with Windows on Worship and you're not already a subscriber, please do hit the subscribe button that will pop up in the middle of the screen towards the end of the video. A link to the jukebox playlist that I mentioned right at the beginning will also pop up towards the end. And don't forget that on the worship sheet you can find links to the individual videos in that playlist, a reminder of this week's suggested resource, and some Bible study questions. But for now, as our time together comes to an end for another week, a final prayer of blessing. God of all our journeys, as we go forward into the rest of the week, may you be the light to our path and the breath we breathe. And may the blessing of the Father, the Son and the Spirit be with us and those whom we love and pray for now and forevermore. Amen.